If you have been with us online or in person, we are doing a series for the month of January, and it is called I Will Do It. Help me out. Tomorrow, I will do it tomorrow. It's a series that we've been doing that really the focus of I'll do it tomorrow, what are we talking about? Well, it's finding the power to change, right? And that's something that we around this time of year, we all tend to, we're primed for, ready for, right? New year, new me, you do boo-boo, whatever, right? That's it, right? New year, what can I do? But so many of us, after maybe a week of trying, after a week of certain things, it's it's hard to find that power, right? The ability, the want, or the desire to do what you need to do today, right? And then eventually what we do today, eventually we'll say, well, I'll do it tomorrow and eventually tomorrow never comes. But today though, I want you guys to look at this. If we're talking about the power to change, we have to answer the question, what part do you play in your change? Do you know that there's a part that you have to play? There is something that you have to do if you want to see change happen in your life. It's not going to happen by accident. None of you just wake up one day and just learned something. None of you woke up one day and realized, I can do this out of nowhere, right? I mean, this is like back, I, I, I'm going to date myself. Back in the day, I used to love the word, the, you know, love the movie The Matrix, right? Neo would get something downloaded. I know Kung Fu now. No, it doesn't work like that, right? You just, it doesn't work from one thing to another, and you know how to do stuff. You have to put in some work, and you have to know your part. You have to know your part, and really, it's not that big, guys. Honestly, we all want to see big change. We all want everybody talk to them. Everyone wants change in their world, in their life. Everybody wants change. Not enough of us want to change. That's the problem. But then we look at the problem like, oh my gosh, but the problem is too big. What can I do? Easy something, right? I can't do it all. You're not supposed to. But just because you can't do everything doesn't mean you can't do something. And the something that adds up are our daily habits. Our habits is what determine who we are and what we become. It's the small things that make a big difference. And some of your habits that you have, the habits of how you think or do or feel, some of your habits are helping you. Some of your habits are hurting. And it's that's why you are maybe not changing the way you want to. So look, at, hey, I'm going to tell you right now, what you need to address, if you want to develop the right kind of habits, you only need one. You need a keystone habit. Anybody ever heard of a keystone habit before? This is interesting. A keystone habit is one habit that actually snowballs into multiple habits. It's one thing that actually changes everything. And so keystone habits are important things. And so, I mean, you could look it up. I guarantee you, Google it, try it out. You know, there's a lot of keystone habits that one thing that you do that makes a big difference. There's a lot of stuff, but one is exercising, right? Now, some of y'all, I'm going to make y'all feel really bad because you said January 1st, I'm going to exercise, and you haven't done it yet, right? It's tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. Listen. Exercising is a keystone habit, right? Because when you exercise, everybody knows, we all know, that if you eat well and you work out, you move, you do something, it has benefits, right? Like you tend to feel good. You feel good about yourself. People who exercise tend to have low stress levels and this and that, right? There's benefits to that. But then it's that will to get up off your butt, get in your car, go to the gym, and ugh, that's, the right, that's the part, right? So what can you do? That's a hard habit to develop. Well, I heard somebody that said, listen, every time I wanted to get up in the morning, and he gave a testimony about Keystone Habits, I wanted to develop the Keystone Habit of working out, but I couldn't do it. I woke up every day, I'm like, oh, it just seems like too much work, right, to get in the car, to do this, to do that, to get ready, to get my bag ready, and get my coffee, get my shake, get over there, and then do everything else. So what he did was is he realized, wait a minute. Every time I put my shoes on, I, I automatically went to the gym. Like, I realized if I can just get my shoes on in the morning, the next decision to get in the car was easy. That's a, so he developed a keystone habit of my job in the morning, I'm going to get up, I'm just going to put on my shoes. That's his goal. Because he knew if I get in my shoes on, then the decision to go working out was easy and it would be happened. So his goal was not to get up and do a thousand things. He only had one goal put my shoes on. That was the habit he wanted to develop. And that one keystone habit 
kind of like a domino effect, helped him make a better decision, which led to another better decision, which led to another better decision. Do you see what I mean there? Those are the habits. Guys, listen, you and I all have keystone habits. Some are good, some are harmful. You need to identify those things. And that's the part that you and I play. But let me tell you good news, though, is that you have a part to play in your transformation, but it is nothing compared to the part that God plays. Because what God has done in Jesus Christ, the fact that he died on the cross for us, lives again today. He plays the largest, the largest part in your transformation. It's God himself. You play a small part, but Jesus has done all of the work. And all you have to do is allow him to finish what he started. Our problem is, is that sometimes we don't know our part. We don't know God's part. And you end up doing, you end up trying to do God's job for him. And you stink. You're not good at it. I'm not, I found myself doing that. You got to know what's God's part. Let him do him. And then what's your part? And you together, that's when God does something amazing. And look, when we change our daily habits, and that's what we're talking about. What, not putting this off for tomorrow, for today. If we can learn to change our daily habits by learning to include God as the cornerstone of our, 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 of our life every day, we put ourselves in a position for God to change us. And that's what's important. It's something small that you can do today that will make an eternal difference. So look, we're going to look at 1 Timothy. It's the, the book we're going to read today. Our, our, our whole day today is going to be anchored in 1 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to read uh, 6 through 10. Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 4, 6 and 10. I'll tell you who Timmy is in a second. Let's just read the verses together. And then we're going to see what God has to say. So chapter 4, verse 6. Here we go. If you put these things, which time out, I'll let you know what these things are in a minute. I'm going to read it to you. Verse 6. If you put these things out to the brothers and the sisters, those inside of the church, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ. You will be nourished by the words of faith and the good teachings that you have followed. But have nothing to do with pointless and silly myths. Rather, Train yourself in godliness, for the training of the body has limited benefit, but godliness is beneficial in every way, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. This saying is trustworthy and true, and it deserves full acceptance. For this reason we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. All right, so what are these things? Paul is the one who wrote this, the Apostle Paul. He is out there, and he is kind of getting, uh, setting up churches, spreading the good news, letting other people know about Jesus, and he can't stay all in one place. He kind of sets up camp, sets up a church, and takes off to the next one, and he kind of puts people in charge and positions to kind of keep things going. So he writes all of these letters, in particular to this boy, this guy named Timothy, which some consider to be a little bit younger than my age right now. I'm 37. This guy was probably in his early 30s. And Timothy was a leader in this church in where he was at. In fact, it was the church of Ephesus. So if you've ever read Ephesians, Timothy was a leader there. And so he's telling, uh, Paul is telling Timothy, you need to correct some of the doctrine and the application that is happening in this church because there's some leaders there that are spitting stuff that literally Paul says, all they do is talk and they have no clue what they're saying. I know you have people in your life, right? You know some people like this guy just all he does is talk and he has no clue what he's talking about. That's actually a verse. Paul says it there. He's like, look, these guys are talking. They don't know what they're doing. And so he's telling Paul, and Paul is telling Timothy, dude, you're there. I need you to correct their doctrine and their application. Why? See, guys, I want you to understand. Bad interpretation of God's word leads to bad application of God's word. If you don't understand what God is telling you to do, you're not going to know how to do it well. And so that is what's going down. And what's crazy is this. This isn't just like an oops. This isn't just a, you know what, this is what I'm thinking. He literally is saying this is demonic doctrine. The thing, these things that you need to point out isn't just ideas that are coming from human beings. These are actually coming from demons themselves. This is damaging what they are telling to do. This is a damaging thing. And the, the, rip, the repercussions of the bad interpretation, which was leading to bad application, was leading people to have fruitless conversations. I don't know if you kind of saw that. He said, look, have nothing to do with those silly myths. Have nothing to do. In, in other places, he says, 
pointless conversations. You guys are talking about some of the weirdest things, and it has nothing to do with who Jesus is and what he wants to do. You guys are so caught up in some of this stuff. You need to correct that. And that bad interpretation, bad application, was coming from leaders who, who literally Paul said, their consciousness has been seared. Okay? Kind of like you ever, you know, you know steak, right? right? It's seared. If another way of saying seared, their consciousness has become numb. These guys can't even tell the difference between right and wrong. I mean, think about that. How scary is that for you to do something that you know is wrong and then feel no guilt? Nothing. In fact, the worst. You do something that is actually wrong and you feel good about it. Isn't that a scary kind of place to be mentally and emotionally? That's where this church was. And so because the people were beginning to feel numb towards the things of God, they were being numb towards God. And because of that, in chapter 1, he says, people have shipwrecked their faith. And people are falling away. They're, they're rejecting God. They're rejecting the things of God because you guys are talking about a bunch of nonsense. And not only that, there are people in the city who are dying of their sins. And they don't want to be a part of this because you guys sound silly. And the things that you're doing are ridiculous. The things that you are asking people to do has nothing to do with Jesus. So the, the problem was that these guys and some people in this church were holding on to a gospel plus. Okay, I know we, that's, that's like a big thing now, right? Disney Plus, Hulu Plus. These guys are holding to the Gospel Plus. The Gospel is just literally this. If you don't know what it is, I love Spurgeon. He says, I got the Gospel in four words. Jesus died for me. That's it. The Gospel is that Jesus, the Holy Son of God, died on the cross for intentionally me. A sinner. He paid for the penalty of my sin so that I, an undeserving person, can be saved. That is the gospel. And it's John 3, 16. If you don't know that one, right? For God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whoever, y'all know it, believes. All we are called to do is to believe that Jesus died for me. We believe it and we receive it. That's it. But there were some people both then and now that still push the gospel plus. Where it's believing that Jesus died for your sins and, meaning in order for God to save you, you need to believe and behave if God wants, if, if you want God to save you. You need to do this, not do that. Go here, not do that. Wear this, not wear that. Now, I, I'm, I'm not going to say that our behavior doesn't matter. It does. But these guys were pushing believe and behave in order to be saved. It doesn't work that way. The reason why you and I change, the reason why our behavior change is not so that God can save us. Our behavior changes because we know God has already saved us first. That he has saved us before we can behave. And in that, that is what changes us. But these guys weren't holding to that. They were pushing some other garbage. And so notice he says, have nothing to do with that. Have nothing to do with that. Those are fruitless conversations. Look, there's things that you and I do. I've caught them. You guys sometimes get caught up, I'll be real, in fruitless conversations online. That sh fruitless, like no love, no joy, no peace, no kindness, no goodness, no patience, no gentleness, no self-control. Okay, hopefully you feel attacked this morning, okay, because that's real. You're not supposed to engage in conversations that lack fruitfulness, that based on your conversations, someone's perception of Jesus is being harmed or damaged. We're not supposed to do that. So he tells Paul, he tells Peter, oh my gosh, I'm getting all the P's wrong. All right, Paul tells Timothy, Paul tells Timothy, have nothing to do with that, but instead train yourself in godliness to avoid fruitlessness. Train yourself in godliness. I love that because notice he's saying, um, Tim, Timmy, I'm going to talk to you. Timmy, if you're going to try to correct somebody else, you can't correct somebody else that you yourself ain't doing. You know what that is, right? If you want to call somebody out, you have to be in right standing because they will call you out. So you need to get rid of that, call them out because he says it's a good thing. It's Why is it a good thing? Because they're, all of these things are keeping them from knowing Jesus, keeping others from knowing Jesus. Call them out. I'm calling you out. Make sure you're not doing it. And then train yourself in godliness. I want you to look at those three words. The word train is the Greek word that we get the same word gymnasium from. When you think of the gym, working out, right? That takes the work. You know, you can't just go to the gym and you just walk up. And I was like, I made it. 
okay, I'm done. All right? And you just walk off. You just can't step into a gym and then you just soak up the musk and then I'm healthy now. Right? Right? It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work that way. You have to get into the gym and then what? Do something, right? You got to do something. So when he says train yourself in righteousness, he's using that gy- the, the Greek word that we get the word gymnasium from, meaning you guys know what training is. Training requires effort, intention, learning, application. Some of you know this if you've ever worked out, you've ever been a part of a sports team, right? You've trained, you've practiced, you've run plays, right? Maybe you don't do exercise. I get it. That's fine. But you've all trained at one point. You've all learned how to cook. That's training right? You've all had to go to your job. How many of you at your job start out with what? Training. You got to start with training and that's some, and you guys know training is ongoing, right? There's always like an update, always a thing, right? That training, it requires intention. It requires being purposeful. It requires repetitiveness. And so he says, you got to train when it comes to following Christ, you have a part to play. You got to train, but I love this word, train who? Yourself. Paul is saying, dog, I can't train you. I can't train you. You got to do it. And you can't do it for other people. Only you can do is yourself. Look, you can have the smartest, the best doctors in the world. You can have the best personal trainer in the world, and he can be telling you everything you need to know. But at some point, you got to do it, right? At some point, you got to take the medicine. At some point, you got to actually apply what somebody's telling you to do. Make sense? So he's saying, boo, dude, you got to do it. You got to train yourself because if you don't do it, no one's going to do it for you. And how do you train yourself into what? He says train yourself in godliness. Godliness is just God himself. Godliness, that word godliness is really nothing but just God. It's the love of God. It is in God's love. Train yourself in the love of God. Train yourself in God's word. Train yourself in his love and that love what does that training look like well the results obviously if you go to the gym you know you're training right if you're getting skinnier and swole right that you know you're doing it right well you know you're training yourself in godliness when your actions your attitudes your behavior your conduct your character looks more and more like jesus right you can't look at me and tell me i've been going to the gym i'm like when (laughs) like uh when i see no fruit (laughs) okay right i see no fruit Right, and so you have to, you have to show, and what does that fruit look like? Training yourself in godliness is in the love of God. That's what that is. It's it's until that love affects our actions, our attitudes, our conduct, our character. That's what that is. And notice that he says, and there's benefits, right? There are benefits to this. And notice he said, which I started with, right? Notice Paul even said, guys, you all know that there's limited benefits for exercising and eating well, right? limited like what does he mean limited well if i eat well and exercise i'm gonna learn how to play the piano like i don't know see it's limited like do exercising and eating only affect some things right it only affects some things not everything it only affects some things it's limited and we all know this and some of y'all are really feeling this okay before you could just wake up do a couple sit-ups and you were boom you were great today You got to be in the gym a whole hour just to burn off the cupcake that you ate last night, right? Like, notice that our bodies, our bodies change, and what we used to do before doesn't work the same. And and, and honestly, this as well, you can eat perfect and be healthy and exercise, do all the great habits. But eventually, that's not going to keep you looking all snatched forever, right? Things are going to get saggy. Things are going to get soft, okay? It just works. It's not perfect. (laughs) It's not perfect. There's limited benefits. But don't we do it anyways? Well, most of us or some of us? Of course, because there's some benefits. So notice in the verse he says, but in verse 8, he says, there's limited benefits for the physical things that we do. But godliness is beneficial in every way. That when you train yourself in godliness, it affects everything the more that you train yourself and be impacted by the love of God the better mother and father you're going to be the better spouse you're going to be the better employee you're going to be the better employer you're going to be the better friend you're going to be the better neighbor you're going to be the better worker you're going to be the better 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 all of it when you train yourself in godliness that is beneficial in every way in every role in your life mentally emotionally physically all of it I mean you get your biggest bang 
for it. The effort. Some of you guys are so extra with some of this. And I'm not going to judge you on that. But look at the protocols that we are doing to avoid being sick and contracting a virus. The masks that we wear, the distancing, the social, the this, the that, the videos, all this stuff. Look at the amount of effort that we are going through to prevent from getting sick physically. Could you imagine if we put that same effort to avoid being sick spiritually? You see that? There's a, yes, there's a benefit for these things, but it's limited. It's limited, but the other things is so much better. It is so much better. And that's why he says in verse 9, he says, This saying is trustworthy, deserves full acceptance. What is the this saying? The this saying is trustworthy, full acceptance. Wait, is it what he already said? Is it what he's going to say now? It's verse 8. What he said that godliness is beneficial in every way, and it holds promises for the present and the future, the life to come. Meaning that when you train yourself in godliness, there's immediate impact right now. Immediate impact right now, and there's eternal impact later. That's what the benefits are. There's immediate impact now and later on. Listen, the things of this world, you and I give ourselves so much. We give ourselves, and we we putting in, we putting in our money, we putting in our time, we putting in our love, we putting so much in to the slot machine that is the world that promises us. Oh, hey, you're going you're gonna to hit now. You're going to hit today. Give me this, and you're going to get that. You're going to receive, and you're going to get all that you're looking for. The world promises us all of these things, and we just putting in, putting in, putting in. And when it doesn't give us what we thought we were supposed to get, here's the hard part. See, the world wants and wants and wants. The world doesn't offer refunds. Devil don't offer refunds. De- you know, sin does not offer refunds. You lost it. Has no refunds. But, see, in Jesus, you get an insane return on your investment, whatever you give him. An insane return on your, if you give, if we would only give a fraction of what we give to the world to Christ, the return on that investment would blow your mind. If you would see that. And some of you know that. And so when we give of our time, of our attention, of our love to Christ, there is always a return. There is an immediate return and there is a future eternal return for that investment of our time and our love and our attention. And so he is telling him, Timothy, you know this, keep doing it, man. And that godliness is, it gives us, it is beneficial in every way, gives us promises for today and the future. And he says in verse 10, this is the reason why we labor and strive. Why do we, again, look at those words, training, labor, strive. Yo, that sounds like work. Uh, Yeah. Okay, you got to put time in. There's an effort that you got to do. And it isn't just like one time and one and you're done. It's little, repetitive, continual. When he says these things, he says, look, he says, this is why we labor and strive. Why we labor and strive? Because we have put our hope in the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. Why do we put in the time? Why do we want to train ourselves in godliness? Because of what Jesus did on the cross for us, what God did for us. That is why we put in the effort. This isn't like, oh, I got to read my Bible today. Oh, I got to do this. and Oh, I got to do that. No, we don't have to. You get to because of what Jesus did. We get to spend time with God. We get to encounter him. We get to because Jesus made it possible. This is why we do all that what we do. This is why we labor and strive. But I want to tell you right now, you are not called to labor and strive alone. You are, yes, you are to train yourself, but you need buddies. You need work. We all know it. That when you do something with somebody else, it's just easier, right? You, like, they motivate you. You motivate them, right? You're, not, you're supposed to train yourself. you got to do it for you, but you're not supposed to do it alone. We all need a Paul in our life, just like Timothy. We all need a Paul, somebody who's been there before, somebody who knows, who's, had, who's gone through, made the mistakes that we've had, someone who knows God more that can, that can answer our questions, that we can go to for help. We all need a Paul in our life to labor and strive with together that can speak into our lives. But we also all need a Timothy. We all need to find who is somebody that I can encourage, like Paul is doing now. Who is somebody that I can, and can reach out to and help them answer their questions? I haven't, off, you know, haven't figured it out, but I'm not there anymore. I can help. We all need those people. We are not called to labor and strive alone. That is why we have the church. But understand as well. 
you are not called to labor and strive alone, not just with people. You need a Paul, you need a Timothy, but you need the Holy Spirit. Because you need people to share life with, but you need the Holy Spirit in order to live by faith. And that's God. God wants to give you that breath, that energy, that power. He is that power that helps you change. It's him. And let me tell you right now, let me warn you right now, if you do not train, I'm going to look right now, I'm going to pause. I'm going to talk to really, I'm talking to Christians right now because that's what Paul was talking to. So listen up. Talk to believers now. If you don't intentionally train yourself in godliness, you're going to find yourself training yourself in worldliness. Automatic. That's real. If you are not actively training yourself in godliness, in, the, in thinking, action, behavior, you will find yourself being trained in worldliness. You will find yourself being trained. Some of y'all can catch yourselves and it's like, why do I act and think and behave? And Well, it ain't on God. It's because there is something, something else that is, or maybe just your intentionality, right? Like if, if you don't actively try to get fit, you are going to be, <laughs> you know, it's not going to happen by accident, right? Like you are going to actively go in the opposite direction. If you're not going in one way, you're going to find yourself going in the other. And that's why, guys, I want to tell you right now, we're, we're talking about a habit, right? What's one habit that can impact everything? Here's the bottom line, okay? What Paul is telling Timothy that he's saying, I need you to do, and then I need you to lead by example, is this. Because if we don't train ourselves, we will find ourselves being trained, being nudged, being manipulated by the ways of this world and by darkness itself. If you aren't intentional, you're done. Just being real. So here is the one thing that we can all do. The one habit that if we did it every day would impact everything is this. We need to learn to develop the habit of inhabiting the love of God every day. That sounds easy. It's small, but it's big. That when you learn to develop the habit of inhabiting the love of God, that love then inhabits you, you change, and everything changes. That word inhabit actually is this interesting Greek, and well, I was looking at the Hebrew word. It just means to dwell, to inhabit. Guys, you all do it right now. You ever, uh, you live in a habitat, don't you? You live in a house? What is a ha what does to inhabit mean? It means to move in, to make yourself at home. You have this place. This is your house. You all inhabit something. You're all going to go to at one point tonight and sleep and where you inhabit. Well, he's saying inhabit the love of God. Rest, find your home in his heart. And there's so many things that you and I can do to inhabit the, the love of God. You guys are doing one of them right now. I mean, this is part of it. This is a weekly thing that we can do, a weekly habit of gathering together as a church. This is a keystone habit, guys. What you're doing now, this is one that impacts a lot of different things. But you just can't do it once a week, okay? Imagine, all right, that's it. I'm losing. It's, it's New Year's, right? It's New Year's. My goal by the 2022 is I want to lose 22 pounds. Got it. You're going to, if you do nothing different, 2023, I'm like, all right, it's 2022. I got to lose 42 pounds for 2023. I got to I gotta lose the 20 pounds I found in 2021, and then I got to lose the other 20 to get to where I want, right? That's kind of where it all happens. And so you have to do what is necessary, understanding, man, all we can do is inhabit the love of God. How do we inhabit? Aside from weeklies, it's every day. How can I inhabit in God's love? What can we do? Well, you can pray. That's part of it. Uh, worshiping, reading the Bible, meditating, memorizing, uh, you know, encouraging a brother and a sister, connecting with somebody, praying with each other, reading God's word with one another, all right? Those are all ways that we can learn to inhabit the love of God. To abide in is another word. Endure. It means, yo, you hang in there. Jesus said, if you abide in me and I in you, much fruit you're going to produce. But apart from me, you can do nothing. The same word to abide is that word to inhabit, to sit, and to be full. See, that's what Paul was saying in verse one of chapter, verse five, chapter one. He said the whole goal is to walk in the love of God. The whole goal. Why are we doing all of this? To know God, so that His love changes us. His love moves in us. And guys, I want to tell you, Paul would use a lot this word sincere faith. Do you know what sincere faith is? Sincere faith is. G such genuine faith that leads to obedience. When you know, how do you know if you believe? Well, how did your behavior change? That's where you know. That is what sincere faith, sincere faith always is belief that leads to behavior all the time. 
And so this is why, guys, starting in our church tomorrow, you all can hop in if you're hearing this for the, you know, kind of late. Tomorrow we're going to do 21 days of prayer and fasting. Why? Because it's all about let's develop maybe some of y'all out of practice. So let's take the next 21 days in 2021 starting tomorrow. Okay? Ends on Super Bowl Sunday. So you can feast after the fast on Super Bowl day. So look at that. I got you. Look, look how I think of y'all. Okay? Starts tomorrow. We are going to, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you, let me challenge you. Fast for the next 21 days. What does that look like? Well, online, there's a document that explains it all. What do you do? How do you do it? Why? The many different ways. I don't got the time for that right now. I put it online. Go to tabernacleofgod.church backslash, I think, 21 days. You'll find it. It's there. And so I want to challenge you. Let's do that. Let's just, the next 21 days, can we grow in training ourselves in godliness for the next 21 days? Okay, removing, let, and how do we train ourselves in godliness? Remove worldliness for 21 days. You're not going to die, all right? If you don't know what kind of food and this and th- I'll let you deal with that. But look, why don't you chillax with some of the music that you're listening to and movies that you're listening to? I mean, let's just really unplug. We need a 21-day detox from the world in order to really encounter God in this way. 21 days to train ourselves in godliness. That's what I'm going to challenge you right now to do with me, with my family, with us. 21 days of prayer and fasting so that we can develop these kind of habits that will become second nature so that God may transform our nature into his. Okay, well, all right, that, that's cool. And, and, and I want to encourage you guys, don't overthink it. It's not about getting a quota in. It's like, right, I got to get, I got to say, uh, I got to read four chapters, say three Hail Marys and all this, and I'm good, right? No, listen, D- don't. It, don't worry about, like, figuring out the littles. That's why I said the most important habit that you can have is just to inhabit God's love. Put time in. Spend time with him. Getting to know him by yourself with others. That's, that's what you need to do. Develop the habit of inhabiting the love of God every single day. And maybe you might wake up in the morning and, and you'd be excited tomorrow. Monday, it's like, all right, I was getting, I'm getting after God. Tuesday, okay, I'm going to get after God. Wednesday, I don't know. I'm kind of tired. Let me tell you guys, look, let me be real with you. I'm a pastor. There's times I wake up, I want to keep sleeping. I don't want to get up and read the Bible first thing in the morning. Can I? I'm being real. I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. I don't wake up. I'm like, yay, I get to do this today. I was like, you know, hold on. I got to wake up first, right? And so I've found myself out of habit. And I've developed a bad habit, which has then, you know, I used to say, okay, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to reach for my phone. And the first app I'm going to open is the Bible app. Exactly. Yeah, right. Right. Because it's so tempting to be like, uh, that one. Okay. And then 30 minutes later, man, no, what happened to the time? Now I'm late. So I'm like, I got to change that habit because that wasn't working. So let me tell you the habit that I do. Ready? Here's how I train myself in godliness. I train myself in godliness with this. It's my toothbrush. Okay. I realized that if I can just wake up in the morning and brush my teeth, I feel accomplished, I'm awake, and then it's easier then to grab my Bible and spend time with God because I did something already, right? Oh, reading the Bible sounds like too much of a big task. So all I do, my, my goal, and this has been awesome for me, you find yours, my goal was I'm just going to get up and brush my teeth. That's my goal because I've gone sometimes, I've gone, I've gotten up and I've gone to the bathroom and immediately dove right back into bed, right, and just 10 more minutes. But I realized that after brushing my teeth, I don't want to go back to bed. I'm like, all right, what am I going to do now? Okay, I want to spend time with God now. So I'll go, I'll make my coffee. And then what I've been doing is I, I've been, I have this uh, in my neighborhood. I got this little street that's like a, about a third of a mile. It's like a loop. So I just walk three laps. That's it. So my goal is to brush my teeth, drink some coffee, and just do three laps. But I'm spending time with God that whole time. See, that's easier to do. And the whole point is about not so much the quantity but the quality. Do something. Train yourself in godliness. Find the little silly things that can get you. This works for me. I don't know what's going to work for you. But I do it because I know there's benefits. Not just dental hygiene benefits, okay? That's another one. But there's benefits in training myself in godliness. Because the more I learn to lean on God, the more I lean on his love for me, the more his love fills me, satisfies me, and transforms my hearts, my desires, all things. So I'm going to challenge you, church, join me for 21 days and let's do this together. Because let me tell you, there's, there's not a lot in the world that we can control. But you know what you can control? Is this. You control the hustle. God controls the harvest. That's what happens. You control the hustle. God controls the harvest. When you put in whatever by faith, 
God will produce a harvest in you. He will produce that change. You produce, you control the hustle, whatever it is. And God controls the harvest. And we do it by faith and trusting, knowing that what Jesus did for us. He did all that was needed. He died for us so that we could live and have that life. And so, guys, I want to tell you, that is something that I don't want you to put off for tomorrow. Charles Spurgeon, I quoted him once. I'm going to quote him one more time. You know what he says? He says that every command of Christ, every command of Christ bears the date of today. Every command of Christ bears the date of today, not tomorrow. And today, God is asking some of you guys and commanding some of you guys to give up. Give up. Yep, give up. Give up trying to change yourself. Give up trying to do his job for him. Give up those attitudes. Give up those excuses. Give up. I'm like, oh, I don't know because I feel it. I've already messed up so much. God sees it. So just stop it. Stop that. Give up and instead give in. Give in to him. Give in to his love. Give in to what he has done for you. Give in to his loving arms. Don't put that off for tomorrow. Instead, listen, put your trust in Jesus today and then put in time with Jesus every day and watch him change everything. That's something that you can do that has a major impact. And let's do that. We're going to continue to do that. And I'm going to challenge you to just do that right now. Uh, let's all, I want you to bow your heads and let's all pray together. Listen, our God is right here. He, his arms are open wide. And he wants to give you and do the things that only he can do. Listen, some of you guys have been giving of your time, of your love, of your energy. You have been investing in the world and you are going bankrupt. You are investing in the world and giving. It offers you everything. It offers you riches and happiness and hope. And you are constantly left disappointed. Listen, the reason why you're doing that is because there is a desire deep down in you, and that desire is actually for God. Only He can satisfy that. And so if you've never put your trust in Jesus, listen, all you have to do is one thing, is believe. It's not believe plus. Believe to start behaving, then God can save you. No, God can change you right now when you do one thing. Believe that Jesus died for you. That's it. So I'm going to ask you right now, if you're doing that, if everybody that is watching online, live, replay later, everybody here, you have never put your faith in Christ, now's the day. Don't put this off for tomorrow because this is a benefit that you are going to see now in this life, in this lifetime, and in the next. Put your trust in Jesus right now and say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for paying the price, the penalty of my sin. And I want to encourage you, these have to be your words because I can't save you in the same way I can't train you in godliness. You got to do it. I can't save you. You have to do this for yourself. And just say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your love. Fill me with your life. Fill me with your spirit. And help me follow you. If you're praying these things, I'm coming alongside of you right now, believing and knowing that God is transforming you, that you are now a new creation in Christ Jesus. If you are praying these things, you are not the same old, same old. Even if you don't necessarily feel something, you don't have to, to know that God is rescuing your soul. Lord, I pray for every person that is watching at some point and even now, Lord, that your Holy Spirit may begin to embrace them now. God, that they may begin to see Lord, that there is a high in your love that they can't find in the world. There is a rush in your presence that they can't find anywhere else. That there is a thrill in your arms by being embraced in your arms that cannot be satisfied anywhere else. God, I pray that right now they begin to taste that. Right now they begin to experience, Lord, the eternal life that we are called and and given, Lord, right now for today. God, I thank you for what you are doing. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, God, for what you're doing. And for the rest of us now, I'm going to challenge you. I want to, I want you, if you're a believer in Christ, and which now you are, if you prayed that prayer today, I want to encourage you and every believer in Christ right now. Let's surrender ourselves to the Lord and say, God, these next 21 days, I invite you, Lord, train me in godliness right now. 
I need you right now to forgive. Ask him to repent. If you're a believer in Christ, I need you to repent right now of anything that you have been giving that you should have been giving to God this whole time. You've been, you should have been giving it in here for us. May we just eat and taste and see, Lord, that you are good. And I pray against right now any form of shame and regret. I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Declare it, Lord, that that it may melt right now in the light of your love over everyone that is listening, over everyone that is here, over all that are coming to you right now. Lord, I pray these things in Jesus' name. I pray for wisdom now, Lord, discernment. Lord, if we have a seared conscience right now, Lord, you said that you can give us the mind of Christ. You said by your power, by your spirit, that you can turn stony hearts into hearts of flesh. Lord, that you can undo the numbness and make us sensitive. God, right now, I pray both today and through these next 21 days, make us sensitive to you. Make us sensitive to your ways. Make us sensitive to your presence. Make us sensitive, Lord, to your word. So that we may see, Lord, that there is nothing that this world can offer that can compare to you. God, we cannot change ourselves. Recognize that, everybody. Tell God, I can't change me. I ask you to do it. And I dedicate, Lord, these next 21 days, God, that I may come to know you like I've never known you before. And I pray in Jesus' name, not only for discernment for those things, but I pray for discernment and to let you know that you have strength right now. That when the enemy rises up, when temptation rises up, when the excuses rises up, that the spirit of the living God may give you the strength to be able to say no to this world and yes to Jesus. No to everything else and yes to Jesus. May you come to know that that strength is in you because it's in him. It's all of him. And may you just be determined right now. And I pray the name of Jesus, Lord, at the end of these 21 days, we will not be the same. We will not be the same. Our families will not be the same. Our church will not be the same. And because of that, Lord, our world and our nation will not be the same. Lord, let your kingdom come and your will be done today in our lives. God, we thank you and I praise you, Lord, for what you have called us to do and what you are doing right now. Thank you for your goodness and your generosity, Lord. And I give you pre-thanks for what you're going to do in us and through us. In Jesus' name, if you believe this, you better give an amen that means it. Amen. Amen and amen.